the spot I usually get as well is the after the big bloated carb infested uh, meal. You have to make everybody interested. But I think these three can do it. Uh, worst comes to worst, James is going to do some backflips for you. We know he can do them or he will try dying. Um, or die trying. <laughs> First comes first things first. We do have one more gift uh, that a sponsor just gave us, and man, there is someone that's gaming the system. But Veronis Tim Banish won a hundred dollar gift card. So if he is in here, you won. Go to Veronis. If he's not in here, well, it doesn't matter. Um, as long, as, like I mentioned earlier, I screwed up a lot of things this morning. <laughs> this is what happens when your wife and your boss isn't here. So just to make sure everybody knows in what area everybody is. First, the nightclub is downstairs to the right. It's where the 80s party was. Okay. Um, today, we have, um, well, you, have, you all know what's going on in, in this room here. Uh, but down in nightclub, we have HIPAA 2015, Wrath of the Audits. Uh, we will talk about this, and this is actually the best one of this slot. Uh, Kevin Cardwell is next door, building your own cyber range. We After our break, we have Evan down in the nightclub, Evan Treefort Booth, uh, presentation sensory perceptions, uh, fixing the fan in a post-poop scenario. If you've never seen Evan, this is basically how he works. Uh, in A here, we will have Kurt Aubuchon, uh speaking of forensic artifacts of host guest interactions in the VMware, uh, VMware environment. Um, and in Ballroom B, we have Johnny Christmas. That's not my RJ45, Jack. Uh, in real life networking for humans. And he's the guy walking around with the cat ears. Not the girl with the cat ears, but the guy with the cat ears. Um, and then finally, and again, these are some really good stay to the end. Uh, in this room, we will have Rocky Brockway, Enterprise Vulnerability Management, like a boss. Uh, nightclub, we have Mr. Adrian Crenshaw of History and Hashes. And in Ballroom B, we have Ben Miller, the great Trojan demo. Okay. Um, if you do go down to the nightclub, there is a cash bar open. Uh, we did that for Johnny Christmas and then ended up realizing he isn't in there. So, uh, without further ado, I met these three, I can say it now, these three youngsters, because I'm an old fogey now, because they keep calling me Mr. And, and so I go, okay, I'm old to them. Uh, at B-Sides Huntsville earlier this year. And, um, for those of us that have been in the field for a while, we know that our time is limited that the kids these days, and I'm using the word kids, anybody under 30 to me is a kid these days, uh, that they are just, they've grown up with this technology. They've learned it. Um, a lot of these younger generation don't understand the, in, uh, the back end area of it, but these three just blew the socks off of everybody. Uh, do you mind me asking, have you guys graduated high school yet? Yes, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, graduated high school. Now, remember that. Two weeks after I graduated high school, I went to a Pink Floyd concert and didn't remember the a week afterwards. So um, these two have done a great job. All right, James Brom, please raise your hand. This is James. Uh, we have Matt Rogers and the brains behind the organization, uh, Morgan Wagner. Now, this is automatic static malware analysis using function level signatures, or how I learned to stop worrying and love the APT. You guys have never seen Dr. Strangelove, have you? I have. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. They just won cool points. <laughs> um, you will be blown away with this. So without further ado, we call them our trio of three kid geniuses. So welcome, everybody. Have a good day. So thank you very much for coming to our talk, since we know there are two other options out there. Um, we'd like to thank Parameter Security so very much for putting on this amazing conference. Give them a, a woo, or <laughs> round of applause. <laughs> uh, we met Dave and Ben at Huntsville uh, B-Sides, and they told us about Show Me Con, and we were super excited, and we knew we wanted to be a part of it. So here we are. We've had the opportunity to conduct original research while in high school, and we are very excited to tell you about it. All right. Oh, shoot. 
Uh, sorry, there's a bit of a lag with the laptop actually changing. Uh, so this is the slide where we talk about ourselves. I'm Matthew Rogers. Uh, we're all interns at Dynetics, and we all just graduated from Grissom High School in Huntsville, Alabama, two weeks ago. So you already know their names. Um, so we got our start in the security world through a competition called Cyber Patriot, which is the largest cybersecurity competition for high school students in the world. And it's basically our sport because we're nerds. <laughs> And so it consists of online rounds where they test OS hardening, forensics, and networking, and the top 12 teams in the nation get an all-expenses-paid trip to DC to participate in the finals. In the finals, teams of five students defend a network of eight Linux and Windows servers against a live red team that's a group of professionals. And yeah, it's pretty fun. Our team is the Cyber Sloths, and our mascot is the sloth in the astronaut suit. I think we're pretty entertaining at finals. <laughs> and last year we went to finals and placed second in the nation. But we fixed that this year. This year we placed first. <laughs> and because, you know, we're teenagers, we took a selfie on stage when we got our trophy. So James and I are going to be going to the Air Force Academy in Colorado. Uh, we start basic training in two weeks. Woo! And for the rest of the summer we'll be marching, shooting guns, and doing as many push-ups as we can until we throw up. Lots of fun. Uh, we both have very different definitions of fun. <laughs> uh, so I'll be going to Auburn University in the fall doing software engineering <laughs> for Eagle uh, and some cybersecurity research. Uh, here they started a CTF team down there, so hopefully that goes well. Uh, like I said earlier, we're all interns at Dynetics. Uh, Dynetics is a 100% employee-owned engineering firm in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, has around 1,400 employees, and it's primarily a defense contractor. So in addition to all the stuff that we're doing, they build uh, missiles, rockets, satellites, radars, all the cool stuff. Um, so how this started is last summer, James and I worked in that little red circle there in a nice little basement that they called our work area. Uh, we were given a sample of malware written by an APT that had been captured after a breach. Uh, the APT was using this tool to establish persistence on the network and exfiltrate some intellectual property to a, another country. Uh, so we reverse engineered the malware and documented its functionality. Uh, the code had been run through an obfuscator before we got it, and we think that's why they handed it to the interns, because that's awful. Um, throughout the process, we found it very helpful to simply Google difficult snippets of code. And surprisingly, the malware writers had actually directly copy and pasted several lines from uh, codeproject.com and Stack Overflow, places like that. While it wasn't very nice that they actually obfuscated it, it was pretty nice of them to have most of their encryption methods and a lot of their how they connected to the their command and control server pretty much copied word for word offline. Uh, so the culmination of our project was creating a command and control server that spoofs the authentication procedure. Um, then it allows the penetration tester to control the APT malware and emulate it as if they were using it themselves. Uh, so thanks to this project, uh, we know that the manual ma malware analysis isn't very fun. Uh, it takes a while to do. Um, and the entire time we were just wishing, oh, we wish there was an automated tool. And that's what inspired our current project. So when we were working on this over the summer, we did all of our dynamic analysis using annotated code. And so we were using a recompiled binary. And the enterprise antivirus on our workstations had no problem with that binary, even though it did detect the original malware. And so that made sense, given what we knew about antivirus and malware detection. But it was still a little scary that a bunch of high school kids bypassed every major antivirus product on the market, accidentally. So this prompted us to do some more research into malware detection methods and the tactics used by malware authors to try to evade antivirus. So the easiest way to detect malware is that if its hash exactly matches the hash of known malware. You just hash your unknown file and compare it to some database of malware. And if it matches, then you get a positive match and you know exactly what sample it is. Additionally, a lot of antivirus looks at the imports table to see if it imports lots of suspicious stuff. And some antivirus uses heuristic rules to monitor malware behavior. It's pretty cool, but it's new and doesn't always work well. Unfortunately, a lot of malware authors are trying to trick antivirus and avoid detection. A little Jedi mind trick there. And one of the most common techniques that they use is a packer. And a packer just encrypts your actual malware into this big nonsense blob. 
And then there's a wrapper program that when it's executed, decrypts that malware into memory and then executes it from there. And that means that your on-disk file looks extremely different from the malware that's actually run, so it's not going to match your signatures. Additionally, a lot of malware has started doing its imports dynamically during runtime, so your imports table is almost completely empty, so that's not very helpful. And sometimes attackers just use shellcode and disable the antivirus engine before they run their malware, so your heuristic rules aren't going to be very useful if you don't have any antivirus. And perhaps most importantly, very few antivirus products will detect malware that has been custom written for a particular attack. Since it's never been seen before, it won't match any signatures, and most antivirus just lets it go on past. Uh, so when we first started this project, we actually barely knew what we were doing, but we did claw our way to victory. I'm also sorry for those puns. <laughs> <laughs> so with the aid of our mentors, we developed guidelines for an ideal solution to solve this malware detection problem. First, we need something that recognizes malware, even if small changes are made, for example, during recompilation. We also need something that can detect um, custom-made malware that's brand new as well as something that is flexible and supports different uh, feature detections such as process injections or key logging, author identification, different types of executables, executables as well as plain old malware detection. Uh, so the first thing that we tried out that was different was function level hashing. Uh, so most hashing will just hash the entire binary and go from there. But instead, we would use a disassembler uh, on the binary and then hash each function in order to generate individual unique signatures. So here I have a Rubik's Cube, and we're going to pretend that the Rubik's Cube is like a piece of malware, and that the individual cubes on the Rubik's Cube are like the functions inside of a Rubik's Cube, or inside of a <laughs> piece of malware. So if uh, antivirus will have the signature of a normal piece of Rubik's Cube that is all solved, and if it's looking for something and something matches, um, this signature, it can detect that this Rubik's Cube is malicious. But after I mix it up with one hand, it can go through and see this Rubik's Cube can go through um, an antivirus machine and, or an antivirus, um, and it can't see that this is a piece of malware anymore since the signatures no longer match. But with function-based hashing, it can go in and look at each individual cube or function on this Rubik's Cube and tell that the functions match functions from the original Rubik's Cube, even if they're mixed up. But we quickly encountered the main problem with hashing functions, since with hashes like MD5 or SHA, any change in input drastically changes the output. We took uh, a picture of some nerds in front of the uh, arch, and MD5 hashed this image and put the digest underneath it. We then went in with GIMP and changed a single pixel at the top of the arch, and MD5 hashed this new image, and the hashes are completely different, since even though they're very similar, the hashes, the way the hashing algorithm works, is going to change entirely. And so this meant for us that if a function were at all different from the original one that we used to get signatures, we weren't going to get a match. So it was at this point that our awesome, amazing, cool mentor at Dynetics told us to check out fuzzy hashing. And as it turns out, fuzzy hashing is really, really cool, and you should look into it. The defining feature of a fuzzy hash is that small changes in your data input produce only small changes in your hash output. And this means that fuzzy hashing can detect the presence of the same bytes in the same order, even if the rest of the file is different, unlike MD5 or SHA. And this is also where we have our required cat photo. I didn't actually know that was a requirement, but it was already in the presentation, so it worked out. <laughs> We found an implementation of fuzzy hashing called SSD that uses context-triggered piecewise hashing. And it's written by this guy named Jesse Kornblum, who is way, way smarter than us. <laughs> and we, we were on his website looking for more information about him, and we found this picture titled, My Goat. I, I don't really know what that means, but there it is. <laughs> so SSD is based on SpamSum, um, which uses fuzzy hashes, and fuzzy hashing uses both rolling hashes and traditional hash hashes. So rolling hashes goes through and it looks for sequences of similar characters that it will, it will create the block sizes based on. In this case, we used UN and ME to create the blocks. And so all the blocks are different sizes, so the hash lengths are all going to be different. So we go through for each of the blocks and we hash each of the blocks and those can be seen on the right. 
And then for fuzzy hashes specifically and SSD, it uses the last um, digit of each of the um, of each of the traditional hashes to create the fuzzy hash. So we went in and changed a part of one of the blocks from Happy Days to Matt Rogers, and then we uh, hashed everything again. And it's going to change only the single hash, um, only the hash for the block that it's in, which only changes a single digit in the fuzzy hash. Therefore, you can see that. The um, two blocks of text are still similar, and we hope you enjoyed the Weird Al, li Weird Al lyrics. So let's go back to the picture of the nerds in front of the arch. So this time we used fuzzy hashing on each of the images, the original one and the one with one pixel change. And as you can see, the hash is only one character difference. It's almost identical even to the human eye. This means that even if there's small differences, we'll still be able to detect an association between different sets of data, even if they're not the exact same. We did some more research and found out there have already been a lot of research projects into using fuzzy hashing for malware analysis. But they all use file level hashing, not function level hashing, limiting the extent of the differences that could be detected between different groups of related malware. So we believe that function level fuzzy hashing had potential, so we created a piece of software called Malfunction to test our ideas. As for the name Malfunction, it detects malware and uses functions. It's not broken, I promise. <laughs> So the central idea of malfunction is that we're trying to detect content and look a little bit above just the raw zeros and ones. And the only reason that we can really do this is because malware writers are really lazy. And as being, having recently been high school students, we know this lazy thing really well. And I think that gives us some unique insight that makes us very qualified to talk about laziness. <laughs> So malware writers really like copy and pasting code and doing whatever it takes to make their solution work. They don't necessarily care about something being innovative or cool or pretty. They're just going to hack stuff together until it functions and can accomplish their objective. And this also ties into the idea that when we're facing an APT, we're not really fighting the technology that they're using. That's just a means to an end. We're really fighting the person on the other end. And they're human too, and we can use that against them. So following what James just, James just said about fighting um, the people on the other end, not just the malware or the machine, um, George Patton said, um, war is maybe fought by, with weapons, but it is won by men and women. So, <laughs> and this is also the war room from Dr. Strangelove, if every, anyone has ever seen that. Um, we would also like to apologize in advance for how much we may be talking about APT since we know that while it is uh, something that we have done our research on, people still need to focus on basic best security practices and things like that. Uh, so malfunction has three main functions, uh, malget, mallearn, and malfunction. Uh, so malget will get the signatures from a binary um, and put them in a specified format. Mallearn will add the signatures uh, and from malget and then put them into our database and then malfunction analyzes the signatures in the context of binaries that are already in our database. So when we originally wrote malfunction it used plain text databases organized into various directories in this little structure that represented what each database meant. But that's because we were stupid dumb high schoolers. And <laughs> now we're high school graduates. <laughs> In, in high school, we learned things about the English Civil War and thermodynamics and lots of other various topics, but I can assure you that quality software design was not one of those things. <laughs> uh, so on our first full day of work after we got finished with high school, our boss suggested we look into relational databases. Uh, so in true intern fashion, the next day we wrote Malfunction completely from the ground up using SQLite. Uh, so our SQLite database has two tables. One table, which has all of the functions that we've learned, with our SSD fuzzy hash, and then a binary ID, which indicates where it's been found. Uh, the other table stores any known information about the binary, such as suspected author, file names it's been found under, under any comments, as well as how much, you, uh, how much we believe it to be malicious. So, malget is what we use to acquire signatures from a binary, and for Malget, you ha you, it supports pluggable modules where you can create your own module that extracts, that extracts um, signatures from a binary depending on the type of executable. And for the output format, it starts with the, um, 
the binary MD5 hash, and then each successive line is the fuzzy hash of all the different functions. So, uh, central to malfunctions operation is the process of acquiring signatures from a binary, and that again is malget's job. So it begins by parsing to get the call instructions, and then it snips out each of the functions, beginning at the start instruction and finishing at the return instruction, and then it um, hashes, fuzzy hashes each of these functions, and it outputs these. And these can be um, PEs or ELFs or whatever um, type of executable that you have a module for. Uh, so the central ability of malfunction is being able to add your binary into the database. Uh, otherwise, it just won't work. Uh, so here is an example of a command that we have put in. So we make two assumptions here. So first, that trojan.exe is malicious, which I'm sure it is. And <laughs> then we have the APT, which is the author of this piece of malware called Scary Panda. Uh, so here, we're piping uh, the signatures from malget. Uh, malwarelearn takes it from standard in and then adds it from there to the database. So we pipe that into malwarelearn and then we know it's malicious. So under that we put it in what we call a blacklist. And that is just our little code for it being malware. Uh, and then from there we specified it's run by the author Scary Panda. We also could have added comments as well as many other features. So malfunction is the fun part. It's very simple to use. You literally just pipe the signatures you want to analyze into the malfunction engine and it does the rest. It compares the signatures in the input to the signatures in its databases and generates a report to explain its findings. Malfunction is pretty much the e-harmony of fuzzy hashes. <laughs> it loads the database into memory one part at a time and iterates all over the functions in it and uses SSD's built-in comparison function to generate a score between each function in your input and each function in the database. And that score indicates the strength of the match. So for a given two functions, a score of 90 or greater indicates you have pretty much the same code. And a score of 30 to 40 means you have some of the same sequences of opcodes, but it doesn't necessarily do the same thing. And a score of zero or just a really low number indicates that they probably have nothing to do with each other. And if you get a match that's above a given sensitivity constant, which is arbitrarily 25 by default, sounds like a good number, then it saves that match for further analysis. And it saves the two uh, SSD patches that score indicating the match and a binary ID so you can do more analysis and figure out what are the links between these two binaries. Uh, so a function won't be very helpful unless we could draw some meaningful conclusions from our data. Uh, so first, functions that strongly match a whitelisted function are removed so that we can reduce any false positives that we have. Uh, next, the matches are sorted by binary, allowing the analyst to see which signatures the unknown file is really associated with. And then finally, a total score is computed by dividing the no total number of strong associations found between the unknown file and any matches with the blacklist signatures, but, and dividing that by the total number of functions. Uh, you can change the reports a little bit with different verbosity flags, uh, depending on how much information you want to receive. Uh, so now that we've learned all three tools, let's go over a quick example. Uh, so in this example, we have the APT Scary Panda. Uh, and it writes a lot of malware, so it's written alpha.exe, beta.exe, and gamma.exe. So if we take those and we run them through malget, and then from there pipe them into malwarelearn, we can see what our table would look like. So we would have an MD5 hash in the first column under binary for alpha, beta, and gamma uh, in that order. Uh, next we have the author, which for all of them is scary panda. The file names, just in case you know they want to hide themselves as default windows, tools, or anything like that. And any comments that you might want to add. Uh, so a key feature of this is that if we were to, say, compare an unknown function to the, some of, one of the functions in alpha, beta, and gamma, and we had high scores like this, so we had, here we had a score of 90, 63, and 78, what that would indicate to us is because the functions are nearly the same, but they're from different binaries, that would indicate that it's writ either written by the same author or at the very least has very similar functionality. So we've designed Malfunction from the ground up to be lightweight and easy for an analyst to use, yet still have all of its various features accessible via a command line interface. And it's very scriptable, it requires no interactive input, and can be controlled entirely through command line arguments, so it's compatible with the Unix philosophy. And it's also portable. It's written in Python and runs on every flavor of Linux we've tried it on. And it's pretty much Windows compatible. There's only one small part that's not. And I don't use Windows, so it hasn't really been a big priority to fix that. <laughs> 
But the most important feature of any software is its ASCII art. And so we've included some wicked sick Dynetics ASCII art when it's run in a verbose mode. So the beginning of the output looks like this. And we could really find a very good reason to put this in the presentation, but check out this awesome hackery ASCII art. Um, the internet is a glorious place. Malfunction's greatest strength is probably its flexibility. It's compatible with 32 and 64-bit instruction sets, so it can process most existing malware. It can detect similarity between known malware, identify an author, or identify particular malware features, so it fulfills multiple malware analysis roles. And perhaps most importantly, more features that we haven't even thought of yet can be added just by learning more signatures to its databases and commenting them with whatever you choose. Malfunction is essentially an extensible framework for detecting code similarity in compiled binaries, and it could even be used to detect cheating in a computer science class. So even though it's 2015 and we still don't have the hoverboards promised to us by Back to the Future, we have brought the future of static malware analysis here to you in this presentation. <laughs> so our next step is the learn everything concept. So we have a lot of malware. Uh, our mentors actually provide us with about 131,000 malware samples. Uh, it comes out to about 900 gigabytes. Uh, we haven't played with all of it yet. Um, we, so far, we've just been playing with small amounts. Um, but we think that Malfunction will really be able to do a lot once we add in more data for it to pull from. Uh, we like to have Malfunction also um, you know, st uh, start a scripting engine. Uh, so Malfunction can, the scanning and learning sections of it, can be easily scripted using Bash. Uh, so we think that it would be really helpful for analysts if they could, you know, script it so that they can do an entire drive at once as opposed to having to go file by file. Um, so we think we can write a wrapper around the existing code and from there have our own little script. So we think that Malfunction also has strong potential as a cloud-based tool. Thanks to having a SQL backend, we can really easily put all of those signatures on a central server and have an organization keep all of their threat intelligence in a malfunction database and then have each of their analysts working from a remote location, all working with the same set of signatures. And to reduce the bandwidth requirements, we can just put the entire analysis process on a remote server. We started working on a malfunction web app where someone can upload a suspect file, it will be scanned and a report generated and it will be emailed back to them as soon as it's ready. So function-based fuzzy hashing also has potential in network security, particularly for networks that are at high risk of APT attack. There's talk of putting malfunctions technology into a hardware firewall doing deep packet inspection so you can potentially stop APT malware before it even hits your network. You can also do the same thing to an IDS. And unlike a traditional IDS, a malfunction IDS may be able to tell you who's attacking your network rather than just that you're being attacked. Uh, so in summary, uh, we have a lot of APT malware that bypasses normal scanners. Uh, Function-based fuzzy hashing can help. And as long as malware writers are lazy, keep, people keep reusing code, and really just, I think it's more efficient, uh, malfunction is an implementation that proves that this concept works. So uh, we've learned a lot during this project, and we'd like to share some of the things we've learned with you. So despite all the various trials we've gone through together, we're still friends. Um, we would like to show you some ad-libbed lines that were ad-libbed during our presentation practices. <laughs> uh, we're not saying who said them, but you might be able to guess as to who has a Rubik's Cube to throw. <laughs> has the view from under the bus, Morgan. Go <laughs> conk. So this is the next lesson that we learned. We should probably try to finish the presentation before the con. We just finished up high school, and we're actually still writing our software as of last week. And so then we spent a while in our hotel room last night working on the presentation. But it's all good. It, it, it didn't really help that we rewrote the entire thing last week. It probably was not <laughs> optimal. We also learned that we should do a better job of commenting our code, particularly. <laughs> particularly when we were about to go to school for a couple months and not look at it. We had to rewrite all of Malfunction just because we couldn't figure out what anything did. <laughs> we also learned that we should do a better job pushing our code once we're done with something because Git merges are really disgusting when no one has pushed their code in like a month and we're all working from home. And this, this is the 
th this lesson hurts because I really like open source, but we did almost all of our development and pretty much the entire presentation on a $199 Chromebook running Ubuntu. I'm really starting to hate LibreOffice now. <laughs> Maybe next time we should just cough up the cash for Microsoft Office. So thank you so much for coming to our presentation. I'd also like to shout out to Armstrong Tisdale, who uh, gave us this Rubik's Cube after I forgot mine. Um, <laughs> and here's our contact information if you would like to contact any of us. Matthew? Uh, yeah, so they will be leaving for basic training and will not have any internet access or any way to contact anyone in about two weeks. Uh, so if you have any questions about Malfunction uh, or want to get in, talk in contact with any, any of us, I recommend going through me. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, you might have to wait several weeks. <laughs> Months. Months, actually, <laughs> yeah. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Currently, we're using object dump, but the reason we separated out malget from the rest of it is so that malfunction is completely agnostic to what you use to get your signatures. And object dump definitely isn't ideal because it's doing a linear sweep disassembly. So we're hoping to eventually write a plugin using Ida Python and use Ida Pro to do that. But currently, the like $6,000 whatever license fee is a little prohibitive. So we're hoping to find a way to either implement some of Ida Pro's recursive descent stuff ourselves or just find use a company license or something. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just as many open source free tools as we can find. <laughs> Anything else? Please ask questions. We like questions. Um, that's an excellent question, and some future interns may get to research that. <laughs> <laughs> But we talked about packers at the beginning, and we never really got back to that. And one thing we would like to do is run malware in a sandbox and then use volatility or some tool like that to try to extract the running malware from memory and then feed it into malfunction and see what we can do. Because that would allow us to combine some of the flexibility of having a sandbox with our crazy Python analysis stuff. All right. We actually prepared a slide for this. Um, <laughs> so, of course, the whole point of a doomsday machine is lost if you keep it a secret, as said by Dr. Strangelove. So we would like it to be open source, but we don't know what's going to happen. Um, people above our pay grade are going to make that decision. <laughs> <laughs> we are but lowly interns. I apologize. It may be either open sourced and put on GitHub, or we might make it a public service on the Danx website. We don't know yet. I saw a question in the back earlier. Currently, we are just comparing it to everything. We don't have a whole lot of um, signatures to compare to at the point at this moment, so it doesn't take like super long as it would grow exponentially. I'm assuming as you would. Sorting know. is an amazing idea, though. Yes. <laughs> I actually don't know, but that's a cool idea. <laughs> we'll have to look into that. Mm -hmm. Have lots of signatures. Mm -hmm. that, that is really cool. Future interns will have fun with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's actually one of our original points um, that we are trying to do, is be able to attribute code to someone. Uh, what we were seeing a lot in the malware we were analyzing is you have uh, very small groups of people writing the malware and then lots and lots of people deploying the same malware samples in as part of some large organization from a country that we cannot name. And so we are hoping that eventually, once we kind of learn the patterns of these individual malware authors, that we'll be able to see where they're just copy and pasting code into all the new stuff they write because they're lazy. Uh, you currently can identify it by saying that if two functions are the same and you suggest that two binaries match pretty well overall, you could probably guess that they're from the same author, uh, but the issue is finding ones that you can pin down as one author in the first place, uh, and we currently don't have a solution to that part.
Well, thank you so much for coming. It's been fun.